All right. What's up, Super Soul Warriors? It's Dr. O, and the grind never stops. And today I have a good friend named Olaide who is here to share her story about sickle cell. All right, Olaide. So before we continue, can you please introduce yourself and explain who you are? Who is Ola- Olaide? Yeah. Okay. Um... Mm-hmm. So, like you said, I'm a light egg. Yeah. Um, I am a fellow sickle cell warrior. And to give you a rundown of myself, um, I'm from New York. My family is of Nigerian descent. And I got diagnosed with sickle cell at birth. Um, so this is something that I've known my entire life, um, that I've been accustomed to, that sort of everything has um, grown from, in a way. And so a lot of the choices that I made have reflected that. Um, I went to boarding school for high school, which is actually a fight to allow me to go because um, I'd have a crisis a couple times a year, but made it through, went to college and Northeastern with you. Um, that was great. And then I would say around my senior year, um, which was like 2017-ish, um, that's when my condition went from like the episodic, just crises every once in a while to the chronic phase. Yeah. Um, and so it took on a much more prominent role in life at that point. Yeah. Um, but luckily, even though it was a struggle, I was able to graduate um, and move on. So yeah. it's still a struggle to this day. Um, but, you know, we continue, we balance, we work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I know, I know, I know. Sickle cell is just a lifelong journey, and it's a lifelong struggle with its ups and downs. Uh, one of the things I, I guess, after hearing your story, and I'm glad you shared that. Uh, what I'm just out of curiosity, you kind of said like during, like at the end of your senior year in college, like your sickle cell kind of started to become more chronic and reoccurring. Yeah. Uh, what caused that, or do you know, or is there any kind of change, or like, do you have any? suspicions on what kind of may have triggered that or how the increase of sickle cell prices is why did it occur at that time that's a good question um and i you know i'm glad you asked that because at the time there wasn't anything that happened Mm. um like any sort of you know event that brought it upon Mm -hmm. um that brought it upon me at the time and so I remember going to doctors all the time and they would ask that question. They would ask, you know, like you were in the hospital maybe, you know, three times a year for the past five years. And now like by March, April, you've had like the three hospitalizations. Yeah. And so they would ask me that. Um, and I'm, and I would say, no, like nothing really happened. It is just sort of a gradual but very stark increase mm-hmm. um, around the time to where I was like, I'm in pain all the time and mm-hmm. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, and so it actually took us a while before we realized that it was actually the sickle cell because my doctors didn't, I don't know why, but they didn't point to that first. Yeah. Started thinking of other things, you know, so you go through all the battery of tests. Yeah. Um, and then that's when I started doing research on my own and thinking, okay, Early 20s is a time where, for a lot of people, our condition grows from the episodic crises to chronic. Mm. Um, So I was able to, through my own research, realize that that's what was happening to me. Um, It was the thing, so not anything random that the doctors were looking into. Okay, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And um, I've been speaking to a lot of uh, sickle cell warriors and interviewing them, and something that I've kind of noticed unfortunately in that seems to be a trend is that as people get older it becomes harder to manage their sickle cell and that's very yeah. unfortunate um and i really it, it sucks to hear like uh so many different stories from um adolescent i mean from adults like hearing all their the, the struggles that they're going through as they get older it, it's very sad to to see and and something that kind of makes it even more difficult is like when you're um kind of transitioning from pediatric care like you know it seems like everybody cares about you and you kind of get a lot more attention <laughs> but then once you get older like it's kind of like well you're too old for this kind of, like that's the energy kind of or like you're too old to be coming here all the time like and then like you don't get as much attention or treatment that you deserve even though for most people with sickle cell it actually becomes harder to manage it exactly 
exactly. Um, that was definitely a very thing for me as well, that transition. Um, it was, I would say, one of the most traumatic times that I've had in my life with sickle cell in particular. Yeah. Um, that sort of having, and just like you said, the way you are treated, you know, as a, when you're looked at as a child who is in need of adult care um, versus when you're an adult who is in that same need, but now they're looking at you as, you know, well, what are your motivations for seeking this care? You know, they're not really thinking, hey, maybe she's just in the same pain that she's had her whole life. Um, then they start to think, oh, you're a drug seeker. And I firmly remember the exact moments in which that happened for me, mm -hmm. um, in which, you know, my, I think it was right around the beginning, my freshman year of college, maybe October. Um, so, you know, big changes were happening. Um, it was a huge transition for me. And I had my first crisis. And, you know, right around the seasons changing, that's too when, you know, crises tend to happen depending on who you are. But for me, that's very true. Um, I remember getting admitted, um, but in the usual, they used to put hematology and oncology together at my hospital. They stopped doing that. But back when they did, that ward was full at the time. And so they put me in sort of an overflow space where not only was I the only patient in my room, I was the only patient on really that side of the floor um, mm. because it was very empty. They would just started putting people there. So throughout the night, I wouldn't have had anyone come to stay with me. Um, I had a support person with me and right at eight o'clock, they said that that person had to go. Um, and of course, I respect hospital policies, especially when they're there to protect you and other patients. But at this point, I was alone. I was alone. I told them I was 18. This was my first hospitalization away from, you know, like family and support where people could be with me. I had one person who wasn't a family member who was like just the only person that I had. Um, and that moment where they assumed that I wanted him there for like, you know, nefarious reasons, the way they, they sort of treated me and looked at me. Um, and they... It wasn't just that they said, hey, this per person has to go. It was, it was the, and these things are so hard to sort of explain and, and to spell out because you kind of seem a little crazy, like reading into people, but it was the change in which I went from their patient to an annoyance, mm -hmm. um, to a burden upon them. Mm -hmm. And after that, when I was sitting in the room alone, I think the nurse didn't come to see me for the rest of the night. Mm. Um, and it was that first time realizing, like, wow, I am truly alone in this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I my last hospitalization in pediatric care, I was surrounded by patients and advocates. And, you know, people would come and, do you want a book? Do you want a toy? Do you want this? And then now I'm an adult, I'm in a dark room, and I'm alone. Mm -hmm. Um and so it really spelled out for me what the future would be like with sickle cell. Yeah. And that's, I'm so sorry that you have to go through that. And um, yeah, I can definitely empathize with that. It, it's one thing, it's, it's once you start to get older, like I said, like, you know, that level of attention seems to d diminish. And it's the, the most annoying thing about that is like, so you're already in sickle cell pain, you're already in a crisis. And you're already like kind of not in the best mood. And now you kind of have to exert more energy to kind of get them to even like consider you or kind of make your case for why you're sick. When you should, you shouldn't even have to be worrying about that. You should kind of just be focusing on getting treated. But unfortunately, there's a lot of hospitals out there and nurses that are kind of, uh, what, what's the right, I don't want to say ratchet, but like, you know, not, not too long or, the, you know, um, I, yeah, unempathetic. I mean, I so I'm I came from Boston, um, and um, and I'm used to much better care. I, I, my hospital is Boston Medical Center, and um, that's where I kind of got most of my care. And I felt then as a kid, I, I I got like the utmost care, and they did everything they could to keep me alive. Back when I was constantly going through my pain, and then uh, I said once I moved to Atlanta, <laughs> I recently moved to Atlanta, and I went to Grady's Hospital. And the care is like, is like night and day the difference. And like, I, I I got unfortunately I recently got a sickle cell crisis and I had to go to the hospital 
and those nurses they like they like it was kind of like they they saw me the first thing they did was like oh like their odds were like another patient like more work for me that was like you could kind of tell that was the attitude and then like the like when they asked me questions you could tell they were asking really quickly just to do their job and kind of like leave alone and and honestly it just made you even in in a much worse mood you know and I, I can I can empathize. It can make you feel a lot more alone and a lot less supported. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I've, I've had that experience a lot, and I can talk all day about the differences because I've been both hospitalized in Massachusetts and Boston and in Atlanta and Georgia. Yeah. And I can tell you that the difference is stark, um, and I feel... It's so counterintuitive to say this, but like the terrible that experience that I had at 18 in a hospital in Boston by myself, I still give gratitude for that over the experiences in Atlanta going into. And, and it's unfortunate because Atlanta has the highest concentration of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Grady Hospital, like you said, has its own, not only like sickle cell unit, but sickle cell emergency. Yeah, yeah. We would think that with these standards that the the level of care, um, it, it would rise to that of the resources that seem to be available. Um, but it's really not true. You know, especially in my experience in Grady, all patients, when you go through the emergency room, everybody's getting the same medication, the same treatment plan. Um to me, that's egregious, especially since sickle cell is such an individual. Yeah, person. for sure. Um, you know, and, and even that night while I was in Grady, I had a wonderful nurse who was very sympathetic. Um, she was the nurse practitioner covering the unit. And it was so unfortunate to hear that even for someone like her who cared about her patients, her hands were tied. Yeah, yeah. Nothing that she could do. Yeah. She looked at my chart. She saw my life history. And she said, I suggest you go somewhere else. Yeah. Like, I, the, you know, and this was coming from her being as sympathetic as she could, that I'm sorry you're going through this, but we we don't have the resources to treat you. Yeah. Inside of a sickle cell unit. And yeah. so even those regional differences can be so impactful. But like how, I, you know, it's hard to think that most people don't have the resources to choose the person. Yeah. They can go to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I can say, look, I feel privileged to say, you know what? I can compare these hospitals and I can compare the level of care in the two cities and I'd rather be in Boston. Yeah. Um, most people, it's such it, a high cost of yeah. city, can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then even in, even in the, the, the best place of healthcare, the, most of the terrible experiences that I've had were at Mass General Hospital, one of the best, if not number one, number two hospital in the country. Yeah. Uh, and so these experiences are even though they're varied between patients, they're so universal. And it's it's heartbreaking, you know, to hear that. Mm -hmm. Like, that story of me and, and transition, that was just one when I was 18. And, and it did not cover all the other times in which people look at me and assume that I'm there for drugs. You know, even with, and that's what really gets me to it. I have an extensive history you can see every single step of every dose that I've gotten, every decision of it along the way. Mm -hmm. And they'll still look at 15 years of history of, you know, care. like yeah. serious care and doubt that. I neglect it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's very sad and unfortunate. I, for me, what happened, uh, I have a, like a, a story at Grady that was, I can relate to. And like, again, it kind of speaks to where's the difference between Boston and Atlanta. Um, and that's kind of down south care. So when um and when when I got admitted at at Grady's Hospital, um, they they essentially like apparently they have this rule where they can't prescribe you like opioids or whatever, and like they really look down upon that. They can't give you your oxycodone or your hydromorphone or the actual strong enough pain medications to to have you go feeling better. And um, usually uh, at Boston, I'm used to that. Like once you get discharged, they give you a prescription of yes. of of your of your C2 medications or like the pain medications that will help you get better. And, and as a pharmacist and just as a sickle cell warrior, like I know how effective that is in treating my condition. 
But unfortunately, when after Gr- at Grady's Hospital, once I got discharged, I literally, because I know my body to a T, I was literally begging the nurse practitioner. I, 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 like, I asked like 20 different like, like staff, and like, I'm like, I cannot leave here without C2 prescriptions because if I don't get my pain medications, I like 95% sure I will be back here. And they yeah. just kept saying like, like, no, I'm sorry. This is, I'm sorry. It's the system here. And like, I guess like, like, like what you said, they're, they're tied, you know, um, my nurses, yours sounded more sympathetic. They were mean about it. They were like, no, you can't even, you know, you can't get it. Like, well, you got, you might as well just go take, you know, like the tone wasn't empathetic at all. And yeah. I kept begging, I kept begging, I kept begging because I know my body to a T. And like, not to like, like, unfortunately, like, like 12 hours later, I, I literally ended up back in the hospital again because I didn't get my pain medications. And yeah. pretty much from there, now because I was de- readmitted twice, I guess I was serious enough to be con- go into the emergency room. And then yeah. at the emergency room, they can prescribe you like... Um, yeah. like somewhat pain medication is not the strongest, but good enough to keep you like self-manage yourself. But it's kind of sad. I had to literally get another pain episode for them to take me seriously and do something about, you know, like, it, 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 but like, I guess that's my story to show you how, like I empathize with your pain, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I, you know, um, I, yeah. I, another question I, I had for you was, uh, what does your, what, what, what's the hardest thing personally? About having sickle cell. Uh, huh. That's a question. Um, wow, the hardest part. I would say before I can really know what the hardest part is, I would say what I what I know is not the hardest part is the pain. The pain is not. The Mm. The, uh, the physical suffering, the fatigue, that's not the hardest part, even though those are tough. Um, I, the one thing that keeps coming back into my mind is the, huh, the daily differences in my lifestyle. Mm. With this condition that I know I would not have. Mm-hmm. Thinking about, um, you know, my, not just my life currently, but my future. And, mm-hmm. um, just the ways in which I, I feel like I'm, you know, I have a set of constraints in life. And everything that I do, plus there's limitless possibilities. Everything that I do has to work within those constraints because if it doesn't, nothing works. Yes. Um, and I think that is really such a hard thing because no matter how long you live with this condition, yeah, you get used to it, but you don't get used to it. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, you know, you might be able to get used to the pain sometimes, um, but then you'll have a really bad crisis, you know, and you'll realize, no, this phase is on another level. Yeah. Or, you know, you'll get used to having to change your plans, cancel things last minute with, you know, family and friends because you just can't physically do it. You know, it's, there's so many things. And as you get older, things change. You know, you're in a new situation. I'm not married. I don't have children. Mm-hmm. But I know when that happens, I will have to factor sickle cell into that. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing that I do in life that I can ignore sickle cell. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what, well, yeah. I mean, that, that is, uh, yeah, it's very deep and, and, and I appreciate your vulnerability. Um, unfortunately, I like to share this statistic, but people with sickle cell are, are four times more likely to be depressed than someone who doesn't have sickle cell. And, um, there's a lot of reasons towards that. Wow. Um, I think one of one of them. I mean, you stated you kind of you said a lot, and I felt like there's a lot to unpack. But like thinking about the future, um, that can be very scary, and I I I can relate to that. Um, I I think sickle cell care is a lot better. But back in the '90s and '80s, like you know, you kind of weren't even sure if you lived to the '30s or '40s. So that was kind yeah. of a concern in your back of your head. Um, now, like you know, you mentioned something about 
um, your spouse and, and your future husband. And now, uh, like, I, I agree. I think it's very incredibly depressing to have to think about, like, 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 can I have kids with this person if he has AS? Or even if he does, am I willing to go through that trauma again? You know, like, kind of and reintroduce it to my kids. You know, um, I, I currently, I currently have, yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, exactly. I mean, and like, but like. It's, it's, it's tough, you know, because what if you really love that guy? He's like the love of your life. But I, I, that's a whole other conversation that I don't like go, go into. But like I currently have a girlfriend, too. I ha- We haven't got tested, but it's in the back of my head. You know, it's like I love her a lot. But what if I what if something go like she has it? And then like I, what I want them to, ha- you know, it's, it's just a lot to think about. So the all things that we have to think about yeah. because we can't afford not to, you yeah. know, I mean. And that's a, you make a really good point too about how like deep this goes because I'm the only one in my immediate family with sickle cell, but I'm not the only one in my family who has to think about sickle cell. Yeah, you know my siblings, uh, my sister who is a carrier, you know her, she also has to ask that question just like I do to partners, you know, and and you, I actually commend you for like you know, sticking out of a relationship and, and seeing where it goes before you get tested. I I think maybe because of how sick this all has impacted me, I have such a fear that when I start dating someone, I'm like, we need to go and get do you know your do you know your status? Yeah. Because if it's if you don't, I, I need that. Yeah. I need to know before I allow myself yeah. to now get in a situation where I'll break my own heart in yeah. a way. That's the, yeah yeah it's definitely a tough conversation and um is I haven't had a conversation yet but I, it's it's definitely something that I have to mentally prepare myself for and uh, I'm, I'm I'm glad that you 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 mentioned that uh another question that I did have for you uh cuz I'm just kind of always curious to hear like people's um experience with their pain like what does sickle cell pain uh feel like to you when you're going through a crisis what does it feel like Okay, um, so I'll answer that question in, in yeah. two parts. Um, when I'm in the middle of, like, crisis, like, I know either I got to hold on or go to the hospital. It is, excuse me, it is very much like a sharp throb. So mostly when I'm in crisis, um, because my chronic pain is in my lower back, that's where the pain will start. Um, and then it'll go down to my legs and sometimes my arms. And so in those places, it sort of feels different. The legs and the arms feel very similar, but the back of the legs and arms may be different. Um, but the one unique character or the one, um, what's the word, uh, sort of characteristic that encompasses all different parts of my body is that sharp and throbbing pain. Um, this is very gruesome, but I sort of describe it to people as you know, those pipe cleaners that we use, like, to, to crafts with? Now, all of those soft, fuzzy threads, imagine if those were spikes. Oh, my God. And it feels like it's being sort of pushed through my bone. Yeah. That is what it feels like. Yeah. Um, because it is a deep, it's it's a pain that you can't ignore. You can't, you know, I meditate to help with yeah. my normal pain, the biofeedback process. And it helps on a daily basis, but when I'm in crisis, there's nothing, yeah. nothing that I can do to make the pain go down. Nothing that I can do, and so that is crisis pain. Um, it's the type of pain that, in your mind, your it your thoughts are interrupted, <laughs> and you can't, you know, at least for me, um, because it is very sharp and throbbing. And now my chronic pain is more, um. It's it's throbbing, but it's not as sharp. It's a little bit more achy, um, and so you know I can sort of think of things and distract myself. Um, but it's it's also very gripping, okay. you know. It's that pain like I so. Don't know so that. you mentioned that you because uh, this is kind of new to me. You mentioned you kind of have like two types of pain. Like it seems yeah. like you're talking about an acute and chronic pain. It's chronic pain, but it's kind of lingering, but it's not really full blown. Is that kind of what it? Because I I'm just I never heard it described as chronic, so I'm just trying to have a better understanding. Yeah, yes, it is very much so. So chronic pain for me, it's um, 
it's because I've had it, you know, daily for, I think, I don't know what the, the clinical definition is, but it's, I think it's like longer than six months or something like that. Mine is going on like five years. Wow. Now. And so it's sort of like a pain that I'll wake up and be in pain. I'll go to sleep. Wow. Anything I do, I'm in pain. And yeah. so it's not as high as my um, crisis pain. Um, that if I was in that much pain, I'd just live in the hospital because there's no way to live like yeah. that. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a different form. Um, not necessarily different, but maybe a bit just lessened. Um, and because it's always only in my lower back, um, that is where yeah. it resides. So I know when the pain starts to get sharper, starts to get a little more, you know, and I can't, I'm sleeping too much, but not getting quality sleep. That's what I know. It I, is I, I, um, man, I, so I, you know, I've had the pain in all different types of space and like to have it in the lower back, the back to me is like one of the worst places to have it. Like, yeah, that, oh man. I, I remember that was by far like the worst pain. Like I had when I have it in my arm. I mean, the pain sucks, but I feel like when I have it in my arm is it's more bearable. When but when I have it in my back, it's just oh my gosh, yeah, I can. Yeah, you you mentioned you mentioned something interesting that I feel like is barely talked about in the sickle cell community that I do too. That I feel like a lot of people don't do. But you mentioned meditation to help you with your sickle cell. Can you speak more about that and how that helps with your sickle cell? Yes. Um, oh my gosh, I love talking about meditation. Um, most of what I do today, I or in sort of like well-being practice, I discovered in the search when my pain developed chronically. I did a full-blown. You know, I became my own doctor. Yeah, I did full-blown Kind of have no source. Everything that I can, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and so. I mean, it also helps that I'm a scientist because I can go in and read the literature and understand it. And so, of course, I don't have the depth of background, but if there's information out there, I can find it. Yeah. And so at this time, um, I also learned that through Mass General, they have a, um, I don't know what the name is, but they have a biofeedback institute to help with pain. And so I asked for a referral there. Unfortunately, most of the sessions are not covered by insurance and they're way too expensive for someone who's not upper middle class to afford. But what I did was I looked at their resources um, and I used that as a starting point. Nine. And so over time, I now looked into meditation for pain and I developed a practice where I don't always do it when I'm in pain. I try to also meditate when I'm not in such high pain, you know, like right after yeah, the pain medicine. For sure. Yeah. Because then I can I can do my if it's ten minutes, you know, whenever I can do it, I feel sort of like I'm more equipped to handle things. Yeah, for sure. So I one meditation I love to do the most is um it's a uh, it's I'm blanking on the name. But it's basically, oh, a body scan mm -hmm. where you start at the top of your head nice. and you throw the 10 minutes or however long you do it, you work your way down and you aim to relax, feel the place, and then mentally try and modify it. Yeah. Because most of the time, you know, you're still going to be feeling the pain that you have. Yeah. But through that practice, you're able to strengthen your ability to sort of control how much of yeah. you feel. Yeah. I am super, 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 super glad that you talked about this. You actually might be, you might be like the first person I've ever talked to about sickle cell, um, about like the the art of meditating and using it to improve yourself. It's actually a video <clears throat> that I planned on creating like later on where I talk about the relationship between sickle cell and meditation because I feel like it's such an underrated uh, aspect that, that you can do yes. for your well-being. Um, I, I don't meditate every day. But uh, I do meditate, like, I would say a couple of times a week. And during the morning, I actually meditated today. And I like to start off my day maybe with like a 10 to 15, maybe like a 10 to 15 minute meditation. And then afterwards, I would do a prayer. And like like you said, I think there's so many reasons why um, it helps. But I think one of the reasons is because it helps decrease your stress. And I feel like there's a direct relationship between how much stress you feel and, 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 and how strong your sickle cell can be. Yeah. So I feel like one, it calms you down, which is very helpful. 
Um, another thing that it does, like you just mentioned, is, and I think it's very important, but it's like I think it increases your body awareness of when the pain is starting to come. So like it has kind of allows you to be a little bit more proactive. Like I can kind of tell when it's going to start to get bad. And that's like my body, like, yo, you better rest. Like you better do everything you can do to, yeah. to make sure it doesn't just go blown out. And I feel like the more aware you are of that pain, I mean, like in that body awareness, like the quicker, the quicker you can kind of beat it before it kind of gets blown. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, it's kind of like, um, like, like. Uh, trying to get like an early diagnosis of cancer before like the cancer gets to like stage four, stage three. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Obviously, it's not always gonna work, but it definitely ha has helped me in in before thinking on more episodes. You know, the yeah. awareness of and you have hit it hit the nail right on the head. It's the awareness of what is happening in your body. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that for me has become a lot more sensitive than before, and so now I can. And, and it's not in a way where, like, it makes my pain worse. I think may maybe for some people hearing that, you know, mm -hmm. that you're more sensitive to your body, that could be a bad thing. But I th think it's not a sensitivity in pain. It's a sensitivity in awareness, yeah. knowing what is a non. And, and then you also develop, through that same practice, you develop the strength to be more resilient. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so that, those are the two main things that I think, um, like, meditation has really offered yeah. Uh, yeah and you know definitely the st the stress component um it makes a big difference like being able to control your stress levels um and not you know have every situation impact you so heavily mm -hmm. i think that that is also key um but it has definitely made a and an impact in my pain and how i experience that yeah you know there are tons of studies there too that actually it it improving conditions at other times. Oh, yes. No. Yeah. So I would be so thrilled to see one specifically on sickle cell. Yeah. Um, I think that would be wonderful. Yeah. I can, I, I could, like, you seem like you're getting pretty excited about, I can, like, go on and on forever about all the benefits of meditation and how yeah. it served me, but I don't want to go on a tangent about that, but I do I agree. There should definitely, there should be a lot more research, you know, and that's kind of another problem with sickle cell that I feel like, like, when you're trying to learn about it, um, there's often not a much information or data. Like, you know, I'll be very amazed if there's a comprehensive paper describing the relationship between sickle cell and meditation, you know, but if there is, that is that's cool. But like oftentimes, once you start to get towards like specific topics like that, it's kind of hard to find like, uh, yeah. you know, those, those answers. Very hard. I mean, even for the most basic things, um, like pain, right? I, Went through the. I went down a rabbit hole trying to find some applicable study that I could use as foundation mm -hmm. for how I manage my pain. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that there are some out there, but we don't know enough, and that's why we have to go out of opiates. Yes, there's just not enough for us out there. Yeah, and I think that that relationship between like the measurable state of our bodies you know what what doctors are able to see on a test yeah. and how we feel the lack of understanding between those two is so great that it makes it really hard to find resources to help yourself yeah. so a lot of what i do is just starting using the literature you know scientific literature as a foundation and then going trial and error from there yeah on my own I was stuff. literally about to say at that point, honestly, it becomes like you kind of have to trust your intuition and then just do yeah. trial and error and, you know, yeah. kind of go on from there. That's that's kind of what I did with my sickle cell. Um, I, I'm fortunate to come from the health background where I'm a pharmacist and like a doctor. So I can mm -hmm. I literally have the knowledge to kind of do this myself. But I feel like this I've spoken to so many sickle cell warriors who I feel like generally just don't know these like to me this is me and you this is kind of like obvious and like well not obvious but like the like at least we're exploring it there's a lot of people who are like don't even know any other option other than like maybe like opio you know they don't they don't know about that so i, I try to make i catch and go and get degrees in exactly exactly <laughs> and at that point i feel like i know it's kind of sad to say this, but oftentimes with many doctors and not all doctors, but many doctors, when I go, I, I feel like I know more about sickle cell than them. 
which I, I don't, I mean, like, you know, can I start? yeah, which, <laughs> which is okay. You know, I mean, I, I have sickle cell myself and there's no reason why someone, a doctor without sickle cell should kind of care more about it than you. It's kind of something I try to talk about on my channel a lot. It's kind of your responsibility to take care of yourself. It's not really like, of course, the doctor is there to help, but I think you should be the one who knows more about sickle cell than the doctor. Cause mm -hmm. once you're going to come across a lot of doctors who for whatever reason, don't know about it. Um, I went to pharmacy school, and in my pharmacy school, like, like out of all the six years of college I went to, they only talked about sickle cell like in one in one class, and I was super excited. And like, they only dedicated like two PowerPoint slides to that, and that was it. And I would imagine that's a yeah. lot of medical schools. So a lot of people don't know about sickle cell. So I'm always stressing like, it should be up to you to to oh, be man, take so. responsible. You know. I mean, I, so I do agree that personal responsibility is a big thing because no one can know your body more than you. Okay. Uh, it is very much true with this condition that you are the expert on your body. Yeah. And so I tell that to people too, that, you know, you should feel empowered, when, especially when you're in a medical setting, because yeah. no matter what they know, you know more about your body yeah. and how you will respond to things. Now, on the flip side of that, it's really disheartening and frankly embarrassing that a lot of doctors especially in this country don't have a foundational knowledge of sickle cell yeah especially when this disease has been used for decades as a model for scientific discovery that allows us to learn more and to treat other conditions yeah better. yeah you know sickle cell we've we're over 100 years now of knowing what the condition is yeah right and so what i see personally is that you know, like, for example, right now, we're sort of in a renaissance of sickle cell research. Like, this is the best thing yeah, for sure. in my whole life. Yeah, for sure. And that is because, you know, we're also in a time where there are big discoveries happening and they need a test case for it. And yeah. sickle cell is a great, very straightforward, uh, you know, molecularly, very straightforward disease yeah. that they can use to study. These for sure. Patients. For sure. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that because it's primarily black, yeah. you know, the population that has it, we are always underfunded, always under understood. Like, yes. you know, just for sure. Everything's below. And I can even tell the story of um, a hematologist that I had. I think, I think he was my doctor for maybe two, almost three years, um, like in 2018. A hematologist, not just like a regular, you know, a person who studied specifically blood diseases. He, I, at that point, I had more knowledge and we both knew about the episode than he did. I mean, there was a, it, it becomes dangerous though, because you are in these people's care, right? Yeah. And so I was hospitalized once and, you know, they did my labs and my labs came back and they looked at my hemoglobin level and said, oh, you're not in crisis. Your hemoglobin level is too high. And now at that point, I hate to say this because I was literally in a hospital bed at like, the level 10 pain yeah i had to go on my phone find maybe like five or six like go into you know google scholar find the literature on the fact that lab results do not indicate the level of pain because you cannot measure you cannot measure pain right mm -hmm. you can't like hemoglobin level does not tell pain yeah i had to go find papers from their colleagues who researched it have my mother print it out so that I can highlight sections and hand it to my hematologist. And now the reason that this was so egregious was because when he, when they consulted, you know, I was, I don't, I think I was admitted at that point. The admitting doctor consulted with the hematologist because usually when you're admitted, that doctor doesn't know you. So they defer to your home doctor. Mm -hmm. And so in that decision that he made to say I was not sickling, they stopped my treatment. So all the pain medications and fluids and everything were stopped for hours and hours. And I was in agony until I could produce the evidence oh to him. And, you know, I did get an apology, but how can someone, what can an apology do when yeah. you've been sitting in a hospital? You know, you went to the hospital, you did everything you were supposed to do. And still, yeah. until you could present the evidence. So, and, and I say that because... Like, I have the background to be able to go and, and research papers and understand what they mean and present it to them. Mm -hmm. Let's say I wasn't a scientist. Yeah. Let's say I didn't have a college degree. Let's say I was not the most literate person. 
Yeah. What would I have been able to do in that situation? Yeah. I would have just left and added. And, and and literally, that's like why, at least, you know, you and I, like, we should be grateful that we have, like, the medical knowledge Absolutely. and scientific background because it definitely plays a tremendous role in helping us to understand sickle cell and kind of know how to navigate it. There's, yes. But I think you and I are, are far in between. It's not the majority. And I feel like there's just so many yeah. people who like not to be like I just don't know enough about it and and I bec- and I feel because of their lack of knowledge they feel very defeated in my opinion oh, like you know Lord. and that's kind of like you know that's why I'm so like um ambitious about my like my platform because at least you know I- I'm not gonna act like it's saving like like it's 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 gonna cure people but I feel like the more you know at least the more confident you feel like you can treat yourself you know what I'm saying and I feel like you know at least you, you don't feel like you just have one option you feel like you can do this or you can do that or you can do this or you know what I'm saying and you don't feel yeah. hopeless to navigate better because not only do I have this background but also when I'm in the hospital and they say, you know, oh, let's say you're in the emergency room, right? You know, you roll in at 4 a.m. looking awful. Mm. And they already have these preconceived notions about yeah. who you are. They ask me what I do. And I say, oh, I'm a scientist. Right yeah. then and there, they always give me more respect yeah. than if yeah. they don't know what I do. Yeah. So not only do I have a better understanding of my condition that I really should not need to have, mm-hmm. right? I should not need to no, have more knowledge yeah. of people taking care of me. Yeah. But I also then incur more respect. Yeah, and 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 then because they're like, oh well, she's a learned person, they think it's less likely that I'm there for drugs, right? Yeah, and so all of these things that should not be in play, I should be able to go to the hospital and get treated because if you're in the hospital, you need help, right? I should be able to go and get adequate treatment. Yeah, but it's unfortunate that unless you are in a position of privilege, which is like even if you have a lot of money, you know, like that is still not enough. Even you have yeah. To have knowledge and and be able to advocate for yourself yeah. and know who the power you know the power players are yeah yeah if, if the nurse is not treating me well i know who to ask for i know to ask for the charge nurse yeah. you know when when i am not getting treated well by a doctor or any other provider yeah. i know to help the patient advocate yeah but a lot of people don't that's that. what and that's yeah and that's like i know exactly what you're talking about and a lot of people because they're not in the medical field don't understand those little nuances yeah. that can play a big role but I'm glad we're talking about it. And uh, and just like you, uh, it's very unfortunate. But when I went to Grady's Hospital for my crisis, like I I hate I I, I hate to pull out the car, but I'm like, yo, I'm a pharmacist. Like I'm not just like another like pro- I know what's going on. I understand I like the the about. intricacies. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I literally like my expertise is in medication. Like you know, so like I, I like and. Again, just like you, like when I'm saying it, I'm not really saying it out of pride. I'm saying it out of like desperation to do your goddamn job. Like it's kind of sad that that's kind of why you have to like bring that up. But it it, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? No. Uh, well, we we're forced to use every tool in our arsenal in order to get treated like you. Yeah. Yeah. Another question I have for you, um, a, a lot is that um, one thing that you did that I, I admire. Is um you took a lot of the time out of your, out of your um out of your day and out of your life to like create an initiative, uh for uh people with sickle cell and and I really appreciate that. Can you talk more about the initiative and what what that is about? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to talk about it. Um, so with the Massachusetts Sickle Cell Association, we have developed what is called the young adult community network um and the purpose of that really is to fulfill a niche where a lot of people post you know transition out of pediatric care end up feeling lost and alone you know most times it's either you or maybe you only know a couple other people in your family or your circle with sickle cell and you don't have a community you don't you know your friends may not know about it you you are dealing with everything alone and so we have developed the Young Adult Community Network to bring these people together um, because, you know, a, a studies show, communities know that when people are together and, and going through things with support and care and love, we have better outcomes. Um, you know, we our lives are better. We're happier. Um, we're able to face our challenges with, um, you know, a stronger foundation. And so that is the point of the 
the, the young adult community network. It's really to have to know, not just know people with sickle cell, but to get close to them, to care about them, you know, have someone call you or visit you when you're in the hospital, um, to be able to discuss, hey, I'm on this medication. It does this to me. Have you guys heard of that? To just have people that when you are going through it and it feels like the world is collapsing and no one understands, you know that these people will get it um, and we will be there so you, and we will be there with you. And so that is our goal, um, you know, to empower, support, uplift. And that's why we create programming to do so, to, you know, spend time together um, while also educate people on sickle cell and their condition and how they can better for themselves um, and really have a community of people around us that allow us to grow and to lift each other together. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And um, for those who don't know, I also joined the initiative um, because I think that what Elida is doing is very important. And I thought for me, um, there was a lot of reasons why I did it. One is because I was passionate about sickle cell. But another thing is, uh, I feel like um, I, like having sickle cell can be very lonely. And I didn't really, like, until I started getting into, like, my mid-20s, younger 20s, I didn't meet other people with sickle cell for most of my life. And that was lonely in itself. Like, I, it made me feel like I was the only one going through it. And so I felt like um, the initiative that we were doing is very needed because I feel like just being able to see other people with sickle cell and befriend them and kind of learn what they're doing to kind of manage their pain and just just being able to talk to someone who just understands their pain is so um, relieving, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's such a good word. I do think like relief is, is a big thing that we feel when we're together in community with other people with sickle cell. Um, you know, like just the other day, I was, <laughs> I was going to see a friend, um, and we met, actually, she also joined the community network and she just gotten out of the hospital. So I wanted to go and see that, um, and spend some time with her. And it was something so small of her being like, Hey, I'm not feeling it right now. Can we postpone that? I know that seems really small, but it's something that I deal with so much when I want to see my friends, especially my friends with obstacle some and you know, the day comes and I'm in pain and everything just is feeling so rough and the anxiety that I have to say, Hey guys, I can't do it today. Even though my friends are wonderful, they're the best people in the world and I love both. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I still have so much anxiety to say, Hey, this condition has thwarted our plans once again. Yeah. That for her to be like, Hey, I need to postpone and me be like, Oh, I'm 100% get it. Or when I need to postpone and she 100% gets it, there's a relief there. Like, oh, you know, it's not just another thing that I need to feel worried or stressed about because this person understands what I'm going through just as much as I do. Um, and that's even the smallest thing. You know, we've shared so many tips on like, hey, I'm taking this medication, you know, oh, my doctor put me on this treatment plan. Oh, yeah, I do this for my pain, you know, when I don't want to take medication. Like, there's so many tips and tricks and things that we share with each other that the friendships that I've gained through the network so far, um, and we're really still at our infancy, has been extraordinary for me. Like, it's it's changed my life in an amazing way. And just like you, I didn't really, like, I have extended family members with the condition but because we live isolated from them i never saw them and i never knew what they were going through they live in nigeria so our lives are completely different and as a result of that i didn't meet anyone with super Sad, like closely until i was i think i'm 28 now i think until i was maybe 22 mm. um I was like 20, actually, no, I'm wrong. It was about five years ago, so 23. Um, we had moved into a new house, and our next door neighbor um, was, you know, this beautiful family, mom, dad, two kids, and the mom had sickle cell. And her and I had the exact same type of sickle cell. Um, she did not even get diagnosed until she was in her 30s. And so her story with the condition was so immense and and to be able to hear to hear her story and be validated and a lot of the things that i had experienced 
was I will not I can't emphasize this enough it was life changing it was 100% life changing and to see that you know she was married and that she had children and you know she was able to give birth to her children like all of these things that like I hadn't really you know or possible for me or that I you know I hadn't really put you know stock into because I was unsure of them to see them true in real life was so beautiful um even after we moved away I still keep in contact with her because it she changed my life by just existing um and all of our similarities with the condition and you know I'd go onto the deck in the back and see her and be like how are you doing today oh it's a rough day yeah me too and and that just connection was exactly what I needed at that time in my life and the work that we're doing in this community network is just so that no one else has to wait until they're in their mid-20s or later to learn about their condition to make friends with people who have the condition to have that support you know we want to like as soon as you transition into adulthood you need to have your sickle cell network you need to have your people and that is what we're hoping to do yeah yeah and i think it's a great initiative and i'm hoping as we continue to work on it uh we'll continue to attract more people with sickle cell who will trust us with their stories and we can connect with and and honestly like just keep growing and growing and make something big with it but with all great things it takes time you know uh one, one thing i also wanted to ask you is um you know, I consider yourself like a, a community leader and someone who's like a vocalist for people with sickle cell. Um, what are some people, what are some things that people with sickle cell can do to like contribute to the community and make sure like kind of just improve the community as a whole? Like if they want to like do something to make a good impact. Um, so I would say one way you can do that is in every state in the country, I'm pretty sure. Maybe not. <laughs> like North Dakota, I'm not sure, but in all state, every state in the country, there is going to be a local sickle cell chapter. There's going to be a local sickle cell organization, um, and in some states there are dozens. I would say find one local to you. If you want to get involved, do you? You know, you have time, you have the ability to find one who is already working. Mm-hmm. They are already doing the work, and so see. Just ask them what they need. Oftentimes they need bodies, you know, to to volunteer for events. They need people to reach out to, uh, you know, businesses for funding. Like, they need people. And so yeah. that is one that you can do it. Even if it's once in a while, volunteer. Yeah. You know, that is something you can that, do. That's a, that's then, a, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. And, and I think the second thing that, um, you know, that might be daunting for people to go and, and find an organization and just hop in. But there's also things that you can do on your own. Um, one of the, the biggest sort of ways in which my life right now is helped is through my family. Um, you know, like my sister is one of my best friends and she doesn't have the condition and she doesn't go out, you know, to volunteer. But what she does in my life is... In, it's something that I, I could not put to paper. And so if you have someone with sickle cell in your life, just taking a little bit of the load off of their shoulders is a lot So the times. Um, it, it, it's a lot and it, and it helps. And so I would say at the very least, doing one, some kind thing for a person with sickle cell is it goes a long way. And if you can and have the ability and the opportunity to volunteer with a local organization, that too will go immensely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I I like that. Like, I think if someone came to me and and like said like, hey, yo, like I don't have sickle cell. I don't know what it's like to go through it, but I feel your pain, and you know I'm here for you, or kind of just some kind of small kind of gesture. Like that would definitely mean a lot to me as well. Um, you didn't make up a really good like point about volunteering in different organizations. Um, I actually came from Philadelphia when I moved to Atlanta, but when I was in Philadelphia, I was actually part of a Philadelphia, um, there's a sickle cell organization in Philadelphia, and I um, uh, was active and volunteered with them for about like a year and a half, two years, 
and it was a good way to um, find ways to uh, give your time to people with sickle cell. So I definitely like that. I definitely like that answer. That, that's it. That's a good answer. And then I have one more question for you, Alade. Yes. And then um, this has been a great interview. I really appreciate your time. My last question is, um, if there was one thing you can change about sickle cell, what would it be? One thing I could change about sickle cell. Yeah. The disease itself or my experience? Anything. It could be the disease, your experience, like just anything. People's perception on it, anything. Like, you know, like. Oh. One thing I could change about sickle cell. Honestly, for me, it's the pain. Mm. Look. Nothing in my life has been as impactful as the pain has. I would change. Yep. You know, I would, I would take away the pain. Um, you know, it's easy for me as an adult to think about, like, things that I'm experiencing. You know, the stigma, the, you know, the loss of opportunity. All of those things because of the condition. But at, at the very base of everything, I'm thinking about child of me. And one thing that I was afraid of and that I wish no other child ever had to deal with is Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, would take I definitely empathize with that. And uh, I, I really want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. This has been a great thank interview. Yeah, and, 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 and I think I think we, we touched on so many different topics and I think there's a lot of opportunity for people to learn um new things and hopefully um use it to improve their lives.